Chapters 13 and 14 of Above Life's Turmoil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Above Life's Turmoil by James Allen. Chapter 13. The Supreme Justice. The material universe is maintained and preserved by the equilibrium of its forces. The moral universe is sustained and protected by the perfect balance of its equivalents. As in the physical world, nature abhors a vacuum, so in the spiritual world, disharmony is annulled. Underlying the disturbances and destructions of nature, and behind the mutability of its forms, there abides the eternal and perfect mathematical symmetry, and at the heart of life, behind all its pain, uncertainty, and unrest, there abide the eternal harmony, the unbroken peace, and inviolable justice. Is there, then, no injustice in the universe? There is injustice, and there is not. It depends upon the kind of life and the state of consciousness from which a man looks out upon the world and judges. The man who lives in his passions sees injustice everywhere. The man who has overcome his passions sees the operations of justice in every department of human life. Injustice is the confused, feverish dream of passion, real enough to those who are dreaming it. Justice is the permanent reality in life, gloriously visible to those who have wakened out of the painful nightmare of self. The divine order cannot be perceived until passion and self are transcended. The faultless justice cannot be apprehended until all sense of injury and wrong is consumed in the pure flames of all-embracing love. The man who thinks, I have been slighted, I have been injured, I have been insulted, I have been treated unjustly, cannot know what justice is. Blinded by self, he cannot perceive the pure principles of truth, and brooding upon his wrongs, he lives in continual misery. In the region of passion, there is a ceaseless conflict of forces, causing suffering to all who are involved in them. There is action and reaction, deed and consequence, cause and effect, and within and above all is the divine justice, regulating the play of forces with the utmost mathematical accuracy, balancing cause and effect with the finest precision. But this justice is not perceived, cannot be perceived, by those who are engaged in the conflict. Before this can be done, the fierce warfare of passion must be left behind. The world of passion is the abode of schisms, quarrelings, wars, lawsuits, accusations, condemnations, impurities, weaknesses, follies, hatreds, revenges, and resentments. How can a man perceive justice or understand truth who is even partly involved in the fierce play of its blinding elements? As well expect a man caught in the flames of a burning building to sit down and reason out the cause of the fire. In this realm of passion, men see injustice in the actions of others, because seeing only immediate appearances, they regard every act as standing by itself undetached from cause and consequence. Having no knowledge of cause and effect in the moral sphere, men do not see the exacting and balancing process which is momentarily proceeding, nor do they ever regard their own actions as unjust, but only the actions of others. A boy beats a defenseless animal, then a man beats the defenseless boy for his cruelty, then a stronger man attacks the man for his cruelty to the boy. Each believes the other to be unjust and cruel, and himself to be just and humane. And doubtless, most of all, would the boy justify his conduct toward the animal as altogether necessary. Thus does ignorance keep alive hatred and strife. Thus do men blindly inflict suffering upon themselves, living in passion and resentment, and not finding the true way in life. Hatred is met with hatred, passion with passion strife with strife. The man who kills is himself killed, 
the thief who lives by depriving others is himself deprived the beast that preys on others is hunted and killed the accuser is accused the condemner is condemned the denouncer is persecuted by this the slayer's knife doth stab himself the unjust judge has lost his own defender the false tongue dooms its lie the creeping thief and spoiler robbed to render such is the law passion also has its active and passive sides fool and fraud oppressor and slave aggressor and retaliator the charlatan and the superstitious complement each other and come together by the operation of the law of justice men unconsciously cooperate in the mutual production of affliction the blind lead the blind and both fall together into the ditch pain grief sorrow and misery are the fruits of which passion is the flower where the passion-bound soul sees only injustice the good man who has conquered passion sees cause and effect sees the supreme justice it is impossible for such a man to regard himself as treated unjustly because he has ceased to see injustice he knows that no one can injure or cheat him having ceased to injure or cheat himself however passionately or ignorantly men may act towards him it cannot possibly cause him any pain for he knows that whatever comes to him it may be abuse and persecution can only come as the effect of what he himself has formally sent out he therefore regards all things as good rejoices in all things loves his enemies and blesses them that curse him regarding them as the blind but beneficent instruments by which he is enabled to pay his moral debts to the great law the good man having put away all resentment retaliation self-seeking and egotism has arrived at a state of equilibrium and has thereby become identified with the eternal and universal equilibrium having lifted himself above the blind forces of passion he understands those forces contemplates them with a calm penetrating insight like the solitary dweller upon a mountain who looks down upon the conflict of the storms beneath his feet for him injustice has ceased and he sees ignorance and suffering on the one hand and enlightenment and bliss on the other he sees that not only do the fool and the slave need his sympathy but that the fraud and the oppressor are equally in need of it and so his compassion is extended towards all the supreme justice and the supreme love are one cause and effect cannot be avoided consequences cannot be escaped while a man is given to hatred resentment anger and condemnation he is subject to injustice as the dreamer to his dream and cannot do otherwise than see injustice but he who has overcome those fiery and binding elements knows that unerring justice presides over all and in reality there is no such thing as injustice in the whole of the universe chapter fourteen the use of reason we have heard it said that reason is a blind guide and that it draws men away from truth rather than leads them to it if this were true it would be better to remain or to become unreasonable and to persuade others to do so we have found however that the diligent cultivation of the divine faculty of reason brings about calmness and mental poise and enables one to meet cheerfully the problems and difficulties of life it is true that there is a higher light than reason even that of the spirit of truth itself but without the aid of reason truth cannot be apprehended they who refuse to trim the lamp of reason will never whilst they so refuse perceive the light of truth for the light of reason is a reflection of that light reason is a purely abstract quality and comes midway between the animal and divine consciousness in man and leads if rightly employed from the darkness of one to the light of the other it is true that reason may be enlisted in the service of the lower self-seeking nature but this is only a result of its partial and imperfect exercise 
a fuller development of reason leads away from the selfish nature and ultimately allies the soul with the highest the divine that spiritual percival who searching for the holy grail of the perfect life is again and again left alone and wearying in a land of sand and thorns is not so stranded because he has followed reason but because he is still clinging to and is reluctant to leave some remnants of his lower nature he who will use the light of reason as a torch to search for truth will not be left at last in comfortless darkness come now and let us reason together saith the lord though your sins may be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow many men and women pass through untold sufferings and at last die in their sins because they refuse to reason because they cling to those dark delusions which even a faint glimmer of light of reason would dispel and all must use their reason freely fully and faithfully who would exchange the scarlet robe of sin and suffering for the white garment of blamelessness and peace it is because we have proved and know these truths that we exhort men to tread the middle road whose course bright beyond reason traces and soft quiet smooths for reason leads away from passion and selflessness into the quiet ways of sweet persuasion and gentle forgiveness and he will never be led astray nor will he follow blind guides who faithfully adheres to the apostolic injunction prove all things and hold fast that which is good they therefore who despise the light of reason despise the light of truth large numbers of people are possessed of the strange delusion that reason is somehow intimately connected with the denial of the existence of god this is probably due to the fact that those who try to prove that there is no god usually profess to take their stand upon reason while those who try to prove the reverse generally profess to take their stand on faith such argumentative combatants however are frequently governed more by prejudice than either faith or reason their object being not to find truth but to defend and confirm a preconceived opinion reason is concerned not with ephemeral opinions but with the established truth of things and he who is possessed of the faculty of reason in its purity and excellence can never be enslaved by prejudice and will put from him all preconceived opinions as worthless he will never attempt to prove nor disprove but after balancing extremes and bringing together all apparent contradictions he will carefully and dispassionately weigh and consider them and so arrive at truth reason is in reality associated with all that is pure and gentle moderate and just it is said of a violent man that he is unreasonable of a kind and considerate man that he is reasonable and of an insane man that he has lost his reason thus it is seen that the word is used even to a great extent unconsciously though none the less truly in a very comprehensive sense and though reason is not actually love and thoughtfulness and gentleness and sanity it leads to and is intimately connected with these divine qualities and cannot except for purposes of analysis be dissociated with them reason represents all that is high and noble in man it distinguishes him from the brute which blindly follows its animal inclinations and just in the degree that man disobeys the voice of reason and follows his inclinations does he become brutish as milton says reason in man obscured or not obeyed immediately inordinate desires and upstart passions catch the government from reason and to servitude reduce man till then free the following definition of reason from nuttall's dictionary Will give you some idea of the comprehensiveness of the word the cause ground principle or motive of anything said or done efficient cause final cause the faculty of intelligence in man especially the faculty by which we arrive at necessary truth it will thus be seen that reason is a term the breadth of which is almost sufficient to embrace even truth itself 
and Archbishop Trench tells us in his celebrated work on the study of words that the terms reason and word are indeed so essentially one and the same that the Greek language has one word for them both, so that the word of God is the reason of God, and one of the renderings of Lao Tzu's Tao is reason, so that in the Chinese translation of our New Testament, St. John's Gospel runs, In the beginning was the Tao. To the undeveloped and uncharitable mind, all words have narrow applications, but as a man enlarges his sympathies and broadens his intelligence, words become filled with rich meanings and assume comprehensive proportions. Let us therefore cease from foolish quarrelings about words, and like reasonable beings, search for principles and practice those things which make for unity and peace. End of chapters 13 and 14 Recording by Andrea Fiore.